Hello class. Today we're going to just briefly go over research methods in psychology, how we collect data, how do we know about human behavior, mental processes, what are the types of research um, methods that we use. So I'm just going to talk briefly. I sometimes feel like this is a little overwhelming, this particular chapter, because there's a lot of statistical um, talk, but it's really quite simple. I'm just going to give you the highlights of what you need to know um, to help guide you. So the way that we collect any type of data in with human behavior mental processes is we start with the scientific method. And if you remember, the scientific method is we come up with a question, something that we want to, um, to research. And then, you know, we come up with, we state our question, and then we come up with a hypothesis, with, which is nothing more than an educated guess. So after we come up with our educated guess, we figure out, well, how am I going to answer this question or observe this question, whatever it may be? How am I going to, to find this out? And so then you decide what research method you're going to use, whether it be observation, an experiment, a case study. And then once you have all of your data, you evaluate it and then you determine whether it's valid or not and you draw conclusions. That's the scientific method, very simply put. So uh, what are some of the research methods? There's different types. When we talk about descriptive research, we're talking about research that um, allows us to collect data, gives us information. And an example of this is observation, people watching. Um, as long as we people watch and record the exact same manner, then, you know, that's a type of research. Case studies. Case studies are maybe may involve 30 people or eight people. They're relatively small. And what we do is we collect information um, from this group of participants. Now, can we apply this to the real world in a massive way? Possibly not. If I were to get have a case study and I researched happiness, but my, my participants were women, I had no men, and they were ages 22 to, I don't know, 38. Well, realistically, I can only apply the information that I find to women that are in that age range, in that gender, and also location. Uh, if they're in a central location, then you can only apply it. Let's say I got all of my women from North Carolina. Well, what you can say is you can find out if there's information that is related, if they all um, have the same form of finding happiness, you can apply it, but it has to meet, you know, they have, is, this is only applicable to women. It's only applicable, applicable to women that are, I don't know, 22 to 38. These, this is only applicable to women that live in, you know, central North Carolina, whatever it may be. The other um, way is, you know, so we have our surveys, surveys and interviews, and these are discussed, um, you know, as research methods in your text. Surveys, we've all taken one. Let's say you go to Best Buy, you purchase something, you get home, there's an email. Hey, how do we do? Did you like your, you know, whatever? Did you um, feel like customer service was good? But that's a simple survey. Um, or a political candidate calling, would you vote for so-and-so? Um, how much money do you make? What gender do you relate to? What, um, you know, what is your age? Is it between? These are like surveys. We do them all the time. We can find out a lot of information because we can reach a lot of people at one time. Interviews are simply put, interviews. Um, you may not uh, find out the cause of whatever you're studying, but you can find out possibly answers to a group of people. So those are descriptive research methods. Then we move on to um, correlational research. Correlational research does one thing. It helps you identify if there's a relationship between two or three or four things. So you cannot find cause and effect. You can only find relationships if they exist. And remember, relationships can be positively correlated or negatively correlated. Either way, it means there's a relationship. 
So an example would be my graduate study. I did um, a master's thesis on do coping styles for stress indicate higher emotional intelligence? Is there a relationship? And I found that there's a high correlation because if you're stressed and you recognize that you're stressed and you positively use methods that are positive, then you tend to have also very high emotional intelligence. Why? Well, I realize, uh uh-oh, I'm stressed. I need to take a chill pill. So that means I'm aware of my emotions, my feelings, and then I do something to guide them. Well, let's say it's, there's a negative correlation or it could be a positive correlation. People who um, have coping styles for stress that are harmful, meaning they drink, um, they overeat, uh, they do things that are not healthy. That could also mean that they are pushing away, not trying to help their emotions. They're just trying to push them away. Probably not going to be the greatest at emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence means that you're very good at reading your own emotions and being aware and also of others and of their facial features and of their bodily movements. You can tell if someone's in a bad mood or not. And so there is, that's a correlation. I did not find out the cause of this, but I found out there was a relationship. And that's really what correlation, correlational research does. Now, then we move on to the most, I guess, probably the most used and what you're most familiar with, experiments. Experiments are the only type of research method that gives causation. It tells us, does, you know, A, have anything to do with B and why? It answers the question why. So because one factor variable is being manipulated and one is not, we have the dependent and we have the independent variable. So an example um, would be you're taking a test. There's a group of 25 students in classroom A. There's a group of 25 students in classroom B. They scored within a five point range of the same IQ score. They are the same age. They are from the same SES level background. They have the same GPA. And you take a test. You take the exact same test. You set the temperature in one class at 70 degrees. You set the temperature in another class at 83 degrees. Who do you think is going to score best overall as a group on the test? This has been study has been done over and over and over and over again. And it renders the same results the class that was at 70 degrees. Because why? Well, when we get hot, we get sticky, we get impatient, we can't focus. It's called the frustration, the heat frustration aggression hypothesis. So in the in the South, in August, you know, there are a lot of aggressive crimes committed. Why? Well, it's believed, not an experiment, can't prove it, but it is a theory, a very strong theory, that it's because it's very hot. People might not be willing to take someone talking junk to them, but only so long, a very short amount. Whereas in late November, they possibly would just, "Ah, whatever, dude, you know, and walk away. When you're really hot, you're impatient, you're in a bad mood, you're sticky, you snap. And so, um, you know, these are the, how, this is how we find information out. Um, we start to link it. So that's an experiment. So we've talked about descriptive research. We've got interviews and case studies and observations um, and surveys. We talked about correlational research. Tells us if there's a relationship that exists. And experiments tells us why. It gives us the cause and the effect. And that those are the basic research methods. Um, you read through a... Um, heads up on, you know, a summation of what we discussed in this particular, in this particular chapter.